Well, uh, good evening. I'm, very, I'm delighted to be here. I'd like to thank you for the invitation and thank you, uh, thank you for turning up as well. I also have to uh, 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 sort of a slight apology, uh, which is, um, I mean, I am, I'm extremely tired from getting to Europe and, and having to travel around your dinky little um, countries very fast. So uh, I'm not entirely here. Um, I will speak today on two, two things. Um, much, I think, uh, in a much more basic and uh, a much more um, uh, structural fashion than Ziggy, uh, Ziggy just did. And I want to, to speak firstly um, about just a, a kind of very, very banal pedagogics of, uh, of style in Baju. Uh, it's a very simple, very straightforward point, as you'll, you'll, you'll very, uh, uh, very quickly see. But once you, you see it, you'll see uh, Baju doing it again and again. And it's, it, it's certainly part of, a, I guess, a, a pedagogy of transmission. So it's the, the first, first point that I'll, I'll speak to. The second one, and this is, this is partially because Peter and, and, and some others said before that the uh, MAMA, the Institute, has just published uh, Baju's Metaphysics of real happiness in, in Croatian. I, I've just uh, a, a friend, Adam Bartlett, and I, and Adam Bartlett is as responsible for the presentation I'll give tonight as, as I am, have also just done this into English where the um, idiot publishers have um, insisted we just call the, the, the text happiness, like a, like, a, like a new age book, right? So this is how Badger is being marketed in English as a, as a kind of new age advisor. So what I want to do in the, in the, the second part of this, this talk is to say something about Baju's recent book. We call it Happiness for, 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 the, for, for marketing purposes here. But how uh, this, this, this new um, uh, uh, account of the affect of happiness, and as you'll hear, I, I think what Baju does in this book is actually, even though it's a very small book, I presume uh, many of you have seen it, actually something radically new is going on or announced in this book. And I will connect that to the, uh, the first points that I make. Um, also, excuse me, as I'm a, a middle-aged man as opposed to an old man, uh, I still, I was told by my optometrist I need new glasses, you know, bifocals, the ones like, so I will be taking my glasses on and off in an attempt to actually read the, the, the tiny text on my, um, on my tiny screen. So, as I said, please, please try and forgive me. One of the things that is not, not I, I, maybe, maybe in, in languages I, I don't read, maybe in, in Croatian or Slovenian, um, but I, I haven't seen this a, anywhere else, is that in the, in the commentary on the work of Alain Badiou, the particular way in which he orients and structures his philosophical work from his brief notes all the way up to his major treatises, uh, this, this structuring, just a, in the simple sense of stylistics, uh, goes, has always gone unmarked. I also want to say something about the structure and say uh, why this structure is crucial to his argument. Um, every beginning in Baju, you just, and when I say beginning in Baju, and uh, we've just heard something about beginnings in, in, in the, with the respect to the problem of love, sexuation, and the, and the universal. If you just, in a very pragmatic and empirical sense, you open one of Baju's books, it almost invariably, not always, but almost invariably begins in a, in a particular way. It starts with a form of self-situation. It then proceeds through through certain negations, certain kinds of negations, to an affirmative constructive position. So this is the first point. Very, very simple. It starts with a self-situation. There's then a set of negations. I'll, I'll go into this in more detail. And then he will conclude with some uh, affirmative construct constructive propositions. The, the very organization of these presentations is itself uh, enacts and exemplifies, it performs and exemplifies the work of, uh, the work of what he himself is speaking about in, uh, you know, one of of uh, 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 Mallarmé's uh, uh, sonnets in, the, in its draft form was a, a, a sonnet allegorical of itself. Uh, Badju's, uh, every one of Badju's uh, pieces of writing in, a, in, in some ways allegorical of itself. Now let me let me give a, a, an example of a, a of a short essay that appears. Uh, it's it's called it's just a short essay in, which is translated into English as philosophy and desire. And the the, the essay in fact opens uh, by Badiou uh, cites uh, uh, Rambo and Mallarmé. He then moves from this uh, invocation of Rambo and Mallarmé. He talks about what's going on in the contemporary world in a general sense. He then moves to an analysis of the dominant modalities of contemporary philosophy before offering his own accounts of the current tasks for philosophy. And he says at the beginning, um, 
This philosophical investigation begins under the banner of poetry, thus recalling the ancient tie between poetry and philosophy. Rambo ex employs a strange expression, les rev revoltes logiques, logical revolts. Philosophy pits thought against injustice, against the defective state of the world and of life, yet it pits thought against injustice in a movement which conserves and defends argument and reason and which ultimately proposes a new logic. So the essay, it's a philosophy, it's called philosophy and desire, it begins with citations from poets. Right? We know in Badger he has four conditions art, science, politics, and love. People talk about what, what, what these conditions mean and so on. I'm going to say very, very simply, uh, he means it absolutely literally. The essay begins with quotes from these poets. These quotes literally, I'm um, underlying literally, orient the rest of the essay. This is what part of what it means to be conditioned, is simply to take a literal, uh, a literal proposition or a, or a statement and then to follow through the implications uh, in, a, in a very rigorous way. So that's, that I, I, I'd like. So the beginning of this essay, to, to go on, constitutes a double shift. Um, there's an allusion to the ancient quarrel that Plato speaks of between philosophy and poetry. And so in the very first uh, lines, Poetry, philosophy, poetry and philosophy together. We return to the ancient quarrel and of course in, in the very famous platonic exclusion of the poets from the ideal republic and yet the way in which Badiou phrases this as an ancient tie. Not as an ancient quarrel here or a bond de lien. It's a, it's a bond. So the bond itself, he, set, he starts off with the poem uh, or the quotes from the poem. He then relates it to the poetry philosophy uh, uh, quarrel. He does not call it a quarrel. Why not? Because he wants to say that even in uh, the most uh, rigorous negations, negation is still a form of relation in this in, in these circumstances. So that itself is a, 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 key, a key moment. So at the same time, this illusion also scrambles the received doxography around the polarities of poetry and philosophy, for Rambo and Mallarmé are invoked here to provide watchwords for philosophy itself. We have, here are poets, philosophy versus poetry, but why is Badiou as a philosopher invoking poetry? Because he's scrambling in that very simple writing the, relation, the, the, the received relations that we, are, we, we expect between philosophy and poetry. At the same time, these, uh, these, the invocation of these poets also establishes the, the very terms in which the rest of the, of the essay will be played out. In this case, there's, there's four words, um, revolt, logic, universality, and risk. And as such, he immediately say, uh, goes that they embrace against the dominant tendencies of our world, which demands, as he says, the liberty of commodities over revolt, inconsistent communication over logic, fragmented specialisations over universality, and security calculations over, uh, uh, over risk. So, moreover, note that this allusion to the poets, it establishes a directive and it's both a direction and a declaration at the same time. Uh, once again, just to remind you, just to do a, just, I'm just looking at the very simple way in which Badiou structures his essays. They're not, it's not, it's not a big thing. I'm simply saying he does one, two, three. Very empirical, pragmatic uh, uh, remarks I want to make, but I want you to see how important the citation of the poets are as an orientation, the scrambling of the received distinctions between poetry and philosophy, and the way in which these uh, uh, epigraphs at the beginning, essentially, all these citations are both declarations, or they're used by Badiou as declarations, and also as directions for what's about to follow. So you can see a form of orientation is already implicit at the beginning, and, and whose logic can be, uh, in fact, uh, traced out much more extensively than I'm, I'm, I'm going to be able to do here. Uh, let it suffice to be able to indicate to you this uh, 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 this this work, because what follows this uh, this opening is uh, is quite illuminating. From the establishment of such key terms in a general polemical context, Badiou then immediately proceeds to outline three specific tendencies that have flourished in even govern this contemporary philosophical context. This, uh, this, this, this piece was first delivered in the late 1990s. It in fact turns up again in some ways as the first chapter of happiness itself. Badiou has taken this essay. It's appeared already in English as Philosophy and Desire. I know it's appeared in, in other languages under different terms. And it's also now still being 
being rewritten by Badshu and, and appears in, the, in the, uh, basically the first proper chapter, the chapter of happiness. So to also mark the fact that even if Badshu has started and, and published these articles, he keeps returning and returning and returning and returning, once again just to, the, to his own text itself, and producing continuously slightly new ver variations. And we'll, we'll, see, um, we'll see where this ends up, um, uh, uh, hopefully, hopefully relatively, relatively short, shortly. Now, when Badger's outlining these three tendencies, he names them hermeneutics, Vic, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Heidegger and, uh, and, and so on, analytic philosophy and also postmodern philosophy. They're the three terms. So he's moved from this general polemical context, po you know, poets, poetry and philosophy, general po polemical context, and then three specific tendencies that govern uh, contemporary philosophy in his description. You can see the self-situation and orientation is already like, like fully, fully underway. Badiou says about these three tendencies, together they form the most global and descriptive geography possible of contemporary philosophy, the most global and descriptive, and further specifies these orientations correspond in some measure to three geographical locations. Note then that the poets, these late 19th century French poets, probably Badiou's favourite, I guess, in, in, at least in a, in, a, in, a, in a very simple way, Rambeau and Mallarmé, have, be, have been invoked, poets from the 19th century have been invoked to provide an orientation for Badiou at the end of the very end of the 20th century, the very beginning of the 21st century, as actually help, uh, to be as contemporary as the contemporary philosophical orientations that they simultaneously will be shown to found and rebuke. So this is something that you you will see in Badiou something that seems out of date, 19th century French poetry, what has it got to say to something above all like analytic philosophy, maybe postmodern philosophy, maybe hermeneutics, but these poets that are invoked at the beginning as if they are as contemporary as our contemporary philosophical, uh, these contemporary philosophical orientations, and yet Badiou will go on to in fact suggest not only to these poets found the possibility of these philosophical orientations, but these orientations in not knowing that and not taking up the challenge of their own conditions, which remain disavowed or unknown to them, then they're no longer even as contemporary as the 19th century poets, which they, which they, they otherwise ignore. Now, does that, that make sense as a kind of uh, uh, structure? Badgy will do this all the time. The blowing, blowing I, I mean to, sorry, quote Benjamin, uh, Walter Benjamin rather, the, but blowing something out of the continuum of history in order to, to read renew its force for the present. This is one of the ways in which Badju repeatedly does this, in this case with poetry, not always, but hopefully what I'm saying uh, uh, makes clear. So Badju himself then makes it clear that these poets are being used at once positively and negatively, although these terms are, are probably inadequate. They're, they're, they're absolutely positive or affirmative insofar as the poets, as conditions, provide the crucial directives and declarations for our initial orientation to the problems, but also negatively, once again uh, with in, inverted commas, insofar as these directives will paradoxically require us to depart from them in order to follow their logic. So we now have a very complicated situation, even at this beginning, which is nonetheless implicit in the in the very structuring of Badju's essay. These poets found these three orientations that ignore, rebuke, or misunderstand them, that are much older than them, but turn out to be much younger than them. They're the temporal sorts of inversions of which uh, uh, um, uh, Ziggy spoke before. And then Badju will use these poets to organize this structure to say how these uh, the, the contemporary situation of philosophy fails this challenge, but in order to take up the challenge of the poets by whom you're conditioned, you will then, he, Badju, will then criticize those very poets by being faithful to them. That may hopefully make some sense. So at the moment the poets are invoked to scramble the received distinctions between poetry and philosophy from within philosophy itself, they provide exemplary acts of analysis and foundation. For as I've said, these three philosophical tendencies share something which has been derived from their po these poets but fail to live up their challenges. To, to their challenges. Why? Because they fail to draw all of the consequences. You can draw some of the consequences but not all of them. But Badiou, unlike Lacan, I think, in this, wants to go draw all of the consequences. Why do you want to draw all of the consequences? Because once you have done so, then you find, up, find out, and this is a way in which uh, uh, you end up in a new space. 
an entirely new space by following all the consequences of the space that you're in. Once again, to come back to the, descript the incredible description, I think, that Siggy gave before of, uh, of some of the, the, the relationships between movement and immobility, story narrativization and, and, and uh, in, uh, uh, injunction in, um, in, in, the, in, the Beckett, in the Beckett readings. So one of the things Badju then does is having outlined these three orientations, hermeneutic philosophy, analytic philosophy, and postmodern philosophy, he then pulls out a certain trait from each of these, each of these phenomena. He says, and I won't have time to go into it, but uh, uh, Badju says about Heidegger and uh, Hans Georg Gadamer, uh, Hermeneutics has her interpretation as its key concept. Its method is to confront the nihilist technological closure and its, a closure, and its aim is to open this closure to meaning again. So you can see he gives a little description. Hermeneutics, interpretation is the rule. Method is confrontation of technology. Its aim is to open. So we have a little triplicity again. Note the triples, by the way, three orientations. Right. Each orientation will then be examined under this triple rule, um, uh, rule, method, and aim. So you can see the threes will repeat, and we'll come back to this again. As for, as, as for analytic philosophy, it has the rule as its key concept. Its method is a logico-grammatical analysis of propositions. Its aim is a therapy of meaning. Um, to show, as Wittgenstein once famously put it, the, the aim of analytic philosophy is to show the fly the way out of the fly bottle. Finally, postmodern post philosophy has the deconstruction of modernity as its key concept. Uh, think of Lyotard here and the, the, the death of meta narratives. It propounds a method that has to be mixed, negotiated ad hoc as part of its, uh, uh, part of its general uh, method, and it pro proposes detotalization as its goal. So, what Bedju then identifies. He identifies, this is what specifies these philosophies vis-a-vis -vis each other. Very, very different philosophies, and does it with this triplet. But then he goes on to say that they share two things which are quite unexpected. One of these things is positive, one of these features is positive that they share, the other thing is, is negative. So, first of all, there's the common conviction of the end of philosophy. And as Badju says, the ideal of truth as it was put forth by classical philosophy has allegedly come to its end, as evidenced in the, the very, very different work of Heidegger, Carnap, and, and Lyotard. And then secondly, there is the central place accorded to the uh, 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 question of logic by all three. So the first, uh, these two features, the first negative, the second positive, thereby, and this is again part of Badju's method, having done this initial moment of self-situation under the conditioning of poetry in this case, he then shows that these very, very differences in the self-situation, they share two things that they wouldn't like often to, uh, to admit to share. And, and by showing this, um, uh, Badju then wants to link these orientations according to a logic that they themselves are resistant to examine i.e. So he wants to show that at the heart of contemporary philosophy, all these three different orientations, they, he's exposing the initial moment of a non-philosophical animus at the heart of contemporary philosophy itself. Now, I hope that makes sense. Three philosophies, these govern, all very different. This is what specifies them, irreducible and incommensurable, at least in the... Then Badger wants to say, no, actually, they share these two features, which are uh, unexamined, and in sharing those features, there's something non-philosophical about these philosophies, and precisely because they haven't drawn the consequences of the very poets um, that, he's, that he's begun by, begun by invoking. Badger then goes on to make two further moves. First, he criticizes these uh, philosophies on a number of grounds, above all, in their, above all in their resistant complicity with the general situation of thoughtlessness that apparently governs, the, 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 the governs our, our, world of today, our world of capital today. As he puts it, if philosophy is essentially a meditation on language, it will not succeed in removing the obstacle that the specialization and fragmentation of the world opposes to universality. Hence, as he then goes on to say, the tendency 
urgency within each of these orientations to locate with some desperation a mode that will stabilise or resist the generalising corrosion of global communications. So Heidegger famously reverts to the priority of the German language itself. Analytic philosophy sutures itself to an image of scientific language. Postmodern philosophy prefers and promulgates the elucubrations of literature and art. In each of these cases, an explicitly political, scientific or aesthetic mode not only fails to establish itself universally, but, none, but simultaneously thereby falls into an unjustifiable condemnation or exclusion of other forms of thought. And this is part of the non-philosophical uh, aspects that Badger will discern in the philosophies, otherwise incommensurable philosophies of the present, that they are covertly governed by condition uh, that they do, uh, by the prior prioritizing a condition whose uh, justification they cannot uh, that they can't justify on their own terms this 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 priority so, nor, moreover, in doing that, it then means that these forms of philosophy necessarily ignore something essential. And let, I'll give you one example. Analytic philosophy sutured to scientific language leads not only to a contempt for especially literary philosophy, so-called, but an extraordinary political blindness to the fact that even today, the overwhelming majority of humanity is out of reach of such a language, end of quote. So such sutures, as Badger will also uh, otherwise call them, entail and encrypt a certain esotericism and elitism, even when they are genuinely attempting to speak universally. So you see how these philosophies purport to say something, but they become much more elitist than they themselves would accept, insofar as they're covertly co conditioned by the priority of one condition, who's whose priority they can't justify. But in doing that, they then start to uh, kind of quite pathologically exclude other forms of thought as legitimate forms of thought. So Badju then uses this trinity of negative examples to forge his own position in a polemical fashion. To do so, however, Badju has to locate what he calls a fixed point, in this essay anyway, a point of interruption, one that is not corroded by the methods of these existing orientations. And it's at this point that, even though he's talking about the non, at least uh, implying the non-philosophical aspects of these philosophies, he himself then ex explicitly has recourse to non-philosophical aspects in order to uh, circumvent the problems that he sees in these. I, I hope you can see what, even though I, I'm just describing in a, what I think is a quite a simple fashion, uh, just Badger's procedure, like paragraph by paragraph, that's in fact an incredibly complicated dialectical machinery. It's all, and it's at work throughout, even even the very, what, you, you, sorry, I'm just going to like, I'm, I'm so tired, I'm just going to elucubrate myself, is some, you know, I always have this like, like a, a appalling sense when you're reading something, you don't know anything about it, and you just know that something's going on here even if you don't like it. And one of the things I guess the, 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 that I feel about Badju is that even however simply he expresses himself sometimes, or however like uh, rebarbatively and unpleasantly he sometimes expresses himself, you must know that there's something more going on than, than literally meets the eye. And I guess one of the things I'm, I'm interested in in, 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 in what, what I'm, I'm speaking to you about tonight is just to, to try and uh, uh, just to unpack a little the, di the incredible dialectical machinery that goes into this. In, in this case, I'm discussing a very, very minor, almost irrelevant essay in, in Badju's oeuvre, but trying to show that even in this, that this tiny little, uh, the, these tiny little works, some, some real, yeah, some in incredible um, uh, compression and compaction of, uh, and uh, of thought is at stake. So anyway, um, Badju, uh, having begun with this preliminary excursus in philosophical self-situation, Badju then turns to the world outside philosophy again. So you can see, you see that he's constantly dialecticizing. Um, he, in order to show now how the philosophies he's examining are simultaneously attempting to follow the directives of the poets, as I said before, even though they don't know it, but yet precisely because they're also sutured to one condition above all, remain too in fee to this philosophical situation. The non-philosophical situation, the corruption of the world, must be confronted by philosophy as a foundational requirement, as you know in Badju. But, and this is something 
something that Badger also says, which is very dialectical again here. He says that even though the world is clearly completely corrupt, and this is what these philosophies are trying to resist, even if in a, in a here, according to him, in an insufficient way, the world itself has a desire for philosophy which it does not know that it has. So even as the world is completely corrupt, even as it corrupts the, the ideals of truth, justice, and, and so on, nonetheless, the reason the world's corrupting these ideals of truth and justice is because it's desperate for them too. And so there's a kind of, once again, the, you can see the dialectical method. Divide, you know, one divides in two, as um, two becomes four, as, as Mao used to say. So, for Badger, you, you must establish yourself with regard to both contemporary philosophy and non-philosophy at once. Such an establishment Badgers must break with both. It can only do so by reference to both. One seeks the points at which philosophy falls back into the corruption of the world, but also seeks the points at which this world itself demands philosophy. And thereby, even the, 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 the very polemical and a, a very straightforward uh, term corruption must itself be given a philosophical bearing. What does corruption mean? There's a, a concept of corruption in Badger, even though he doesn't, or even though it sometimes just seems like a, a kind of a rhetorical or a polemical flow it's a drive towards particularity, totality, inconsistency and injustice that simultaneously demands the restitution of universalism, infinity, consistency and justice and part of the corruption is that the, the corrupt, what's corrupt definitely also demands what's good, if that's, a, if that's not a too... So, um, let me just flick through my phone desperately. Okay, having, I've, I've sketched this for you. You begin with a declaration, a declaration that comes from outside philosophy. You then use these uh, uh, as a direction. You give yourself a self-situation, general terms of philosophy itself in three times, each of three versions. Each of these three versions are examined under three different headings. There's then a, a, an analysis of what these, three, these differences share by, despite themselves, both positive and negative. Right? This is what ba Badju is doing. And then Badju shows how they're in succumb to the corruption of the world with which they're trying to break, but the world itself is demanding something like that. There must be a way to break this kind of mutual, uh, uh, this mutual uh, deadlock. And to do that, and this is the really, really key, I say, I've, I've noted all the threes, he always tries to pinpoint a fourth position that all these dominant tendencies reject, right? So he tries to find, having situated one, two, three, What's different about them? What do they share? He then constructs on the basis of the self-situation a fourth point that none of those things can say yes to. Right? This is, it's actually a work of philosophical instruction, even in these little essays. He establishes himself in this impossible fourth position with a concomitant modification of the form of philosophical presentation itself. So I'm just going to give you uh, a, a couple more examples. The first one is this uh, uh, one of uh, one of his very minor books uh, called Being an Event, and um, in Being an Event he says this at the very very beginning of the treatise. Let's premise the analysis of the current global state of philosophy on the following three assumptions: Heidegger is the last universally recognisable philosopher. Those programs of thought, especially the American, which have followed the developments in mathematics and logic and in the work of the Vienna Circle, have succeeded in conserving the figure of scientific rationality as a paradigm for thought. Three, a post-Cartesian doctrine of the subject is unfolding. Its origin can be traced to non-philosophical practices, whether those practices be political or relating to mental illness, and its regime of interpretation marked by the names of Marx and Lenin, Freud and Lacan is complicated by clinical or militant operations, which go beyond transmissible discourse. And what does Badju do here? Exactly as I've just said. He outlines a fourth position, his own on the basis of this situation. To do so, he draws a diagonal, his favourite image of Badju's through the three, simultaneously showing their differences, what they inadvertently share, how they can be used to confront each other, and then what can genuinely be taken from them. This procedure creates this fourth position that none of these positions could have affirmed on their own, and yet which could not be minimally sketched, 
without this foundational self-situation at the beginning. Uh, the other example I'll give here is The Century. Uh, on the face of it, an altogether different book. It attends to major cultural achievements of the 20th century from Malevich through Freud and the Surrealists and beyond. It's not a formal ontological reconsideration of the status of mathematics. And The Century opens precisely by discussing three plausible contemporary accounts of the 20th century. In Jan Volker's words, the century is a time frame which can be counted threefold, as the communist century from the war of 1914-18 through the end of the Soviet Union, or as the totalitarian century dating from 1917 to 1976, the year of Mao's death. Then it can also be counted as the liberal century, the victory of capital, lasting 30 years from the 70s onwards. Now, though Volker has quite rightly uh, discerned the introductory import of this threefold, he doesn't expand further in, in his essay upon what this, th this means. It, beyond remarking that the threefold count seems to indicate that its intention is not historical. Now that's quite correct, but I want to, to say a little more in lines with some of the things I've already been saying. To summarise, each of these narratives, the communist, the totalitarian, the liberal, they're indeed plausible. They nonetheless cannot be hold, held altogether without inconsistency. They can't be reduced to each other, yet they must be held together. This is part of uh, Badger's logic. In placing them in opposition with one another, they're restricted respective strengths and limitations are exposed, this then also exposes their status, in this case representational nature, insofar as what do they not do? They don't take the century on its own terms, even though they precisely do. Once again, Badiou, by doing this initial self-situation, wants to show that it retains perhaps, and uh, to use the, this, this metaphor from being an event, they're, they're too representational, they're too statist, and yet it's with respect to them that one has to orient one's own account. Out. That's part of the. Uh, it's part of the um, thing. So. We have another conceptual implication to add to Badiou's procedure in exposing the representational claims of such partial meta-narratives to each other. It exposes the necessity to return to the sources themselves. So back to the things themselves is, of course, a, a crucial phenomenological catch cry, but it's one of the recurrent moves of philosophy itself. And Badiou likes to, to quote Plato's Cratylus in this regard. We philosophers do not take as our point of departure words but things. Now, the only thing I would say about this quote, I, I, I was speaking before uh, about uh, with uh, people who agree that Badger does, while he does seem to quote uh, philosophical classics, he often misquotes them. And for the life of me, I have never been able to find this in the Crassilis, no, much, no, no matter how hard I've, I've looked. But nonetheless, Badger quotes it quite often and, and, and exactly in this form. I'm, I'm presuming it's doing some good work for him. However, one of the things I would also like to then point to about this very peculiar uh, recurrent staging in Badiou is that it's precisely a contemporary form of a platonic dialogue, not in the sense of characters who become representatives of particular positions brought together into certain circumstances and in order to discuss certain themes and with all of the, the complexities that the, that the dialogue form, of course, notoriously, uh, notoriously entails. But it's dialogic in the sense of an analysis, the fundamental aspect of a topology of the, a topology of the irreducibility and partiality of even the strongest forms of representation by placing them in the same space and then thereby reducing them simultaneously to their key operations and to the apparias which they cannot think. This is, of course, very famously the, 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 the procedure of Socrates, who, who the only thing he knows, he, don't, you know, he knows nothing, and he constantly reduces into interlocutors to a, a, a apparias or to, to, to impasses, to deadlocks. I hope you can see that what I've been saying already about Badger's procedure is that's exactly what he's doing with these interlocutors, reducing them not in the, the dialogic form in a quite, you know, a very 20th century uh, elite French educational form, certainly, but nonetheless it still has a dialogic structure, at least in, 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 in this case. Now, note that this Procedure also has the effect of making the allegedly old or outmoded newly contemporary to return it or return to it its powers as forever young. Now, that's the, the, there's obviously a lot more to be said about that, but I, I just want to uh, 
I guess, direct your attention to the recurrence of this structuring of almost all of his work. It's like quite phenomenal when you start to see it. Yes, there are exceptions and we might talk about them later, but what I want to do is say this, you know, this is not just a method or a form, an empty sort of form that can just be applied simply to every to everything that you ever meet, and I don't think Badju is, but nonetheless, like, like if, you, if any of you are students and you're writing something up, this is one of the best ways you could possibly produce a PhD thesis, in my opinion. You say, look, here is the foundation question. Here are the three things that are currently reigning. What do they all say? Look, here is the fourth position they do not say. How am I going? Okay, you can use this. Like, fantastic. <laughs> However, what I want to say is that it's not just an, a, a recurrent for, uh, kind of formal device that you, where you just boom, 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 you stamp stuff out. And I want to, to, to show this, or at least suggest this very briefly now, with respect to the, the aforementioned text of, uh, of happiness. Because one of the, and, I, I, and what I want to, I want to say just a, a few brief things, I guess. Well, I, I know we're, it's very late and we're, we're running out of time. Um, um, but I want to suggest that even as Badju, I guess, repeats this template, he's using it to change himself. He actually pushes himself. It's not a, a work of complacency. It's a kind of, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a torsion of anxiety. And a torsion of anxiety that, as, a, as it is, is a very happy one. It, it leads to, it's a procedure that leads to new uh, problems for Badju and new attempted solutions on his own part. So, in, the, in his philosophical return to happiness against its capture by the partisans of normalization, Badju necessarily reta is returning to the history of philosophy itself. So if happiness is perhaps one of the most basic and universal of human goals, it's also one of the great themes of ancient philosophy. What is happiness and what do I have to do to be happy are its fundamental questions. Unfortunately, part of the difficulty of these questions is answers of the type never eat beans or watch only two hours of TV maximum a day are not going to cuss it for very long, no matter how adaptive to reality they might make you. Right. If human beings could do this, it would be easy to be happy. Now, this is precisely because, as ancient philosophy uh, points out, it's because happiness must be born from an obscurity or an aporia itself. It's not for the want of choice of different models of behaviour that happiness remains opaque. In fact, much of the dynamism of ancient philosophy, as we know, is driven by deep, deep acknowledgement of the divisions and divergences of human beings from Persia to the Piraeus. One of the consequences of such an acknowledgement, as Leo Strauss once put it, is that the evidence of em the empirical di di distinctions, differences, if they're not accepted as a question of mere contingent variation in themselves, leads to an absolutely fundamental philosophical di distinction. Let's call it here the difference between nature and, uh, and, and culture, something like that. The distinction between nature and convention, Strauss writes, between Fusus and Nomos, is therefore coeval with the discovery of nature and hence with philosophy. And philosophy Philosophy, therefore, begins with this rift. Even if philosophy may subsequently seek to reduce or exacerbate the claims of the distinction, the distinction nonetheless requires both explanation and intervention if one's to meet the test of reason. So, in other words, the philosophical questions concerning happiness turn simultaneously, I guess, on, on immediate uh, kind of intimate experience and this divided uh, social uh, uh, nomos fus, the nature from nomos and fusus. Yet, and this is also one of the problems for ancient philosophy, is questions of happiness happiness and never just personal and social slash national, that they must be cosmological as well. Happiness is a cosmological question, not just a personal one. I mean, otherwise there's no philosophy, right? So, if our own nature is not simply or unilaterally given, what is our relation to nature, blah, 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 blah. Now, what, what happens is, as soon as you start asking then what is happy, happiness, you very simply end up at cosmological level and therefore you need a metaphysics. You cannot have any answers to the question, what is happiness, unless you actually have a metaphysics, right? That's the very short. Thing. It's not something that um, I, I know. This is a new age book that I'm, I'm citing from here, but but really, like, there's a reason why new age 
even even as even as it's uh, uh, most lamentable and often contemptible and like really really like quite revolting kind of a metaphysical propositions it's crucial for the new age that they're responding to a real problem you cannot answer the problem of happiness without cosmology and that's why new age books are necessarily cosmological as well they're they're responding to an absolute necessity so disgusting as one might find them nonetheless we should necessarily attend to the necessity of them of them always making metaphys having metaphysical propositions right always they become systematic even if often irrational and illogical you know mystical in, in in the bad sense and so on it's it's very important so what as soon as you start to pose the question of happiness happiness becomes a violently polemical affair you have to start fighting over happiness which often makes people happy sometimes unhappy I don't know. So anyway, I, I, we could give some examples, but what I want to do is to is to jump forward to what Badju actually like 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 uh, 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 does today. One of the problems for Badju, if we were going to situate Badju according to this triplet himself, according to the way in which he himself establishes his relationships to other people in a triplet, I would say that he's caught today between three pro. He has three problems. The third within the book Happiness. The first one is that uh, um, things like New Ageism and in fact neoliberal capitalism now have happiness studies because it turns out that happiness is crucial to having good workers because you produce more and you get sick less and you're going to stay at work etc etc so happiness today is something that is completely corrupted in a, in a in a public sense it's now entered the the the, the, the kind of you know the uh, you know psychological psychological testing at, at work um, uh, comportment uh, directives um, uh, uh, the introduction of like pat a dog day at work I don't know if you have this here but in the law faculty at my university for your relaxation some guy brings a dog around and you you pass it and then you're apparently meant to feel like immeasurably better and you can go back to work and get massages all sorts of happy so so three things for Badger. The first thing is happiness is absolutely corrupted today as a, as a category. New ageism and neoliberalism down to the, you know, the, the, the transformation of, of like really, really micro work practices. Secondly, there is an extremely strong line, I guess, of anti-philosophy, which would include Pascal and um, uh, uh, Kierkegaard most boasts directly in this book happiness but also someone like Freud and I think that the, 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 cri the critique of happiness as it comes from psychoanalysis is an unbelievably uh, it offers an incredibly strong um, uh, riposte to anyone based on it, it's based on trauma right and in fact uh, uh, you know an absolute the traumatism of the organism such that anything that you want to say about happiness is is, is most often a, an imaginary or a, a, an otherwise dissimilar simulating phenomenon. So here it is. We have the corruption of the wor world, uh, the corruption of happiness in the world today. We also have an incredibly strong critique of the very, like, on the very idea of happiness by psychoanalysis. And moreover, um, Badger himself has always said, very importantly in all of his philosophy, that the philosopher himself or herself is not a subject. You know, there's not a subject to truth. There are only four procedures which produce truths, like art, science, politics, and love. Philosophy itself, Badju in fact says at one point in being a fan, he says, much though it hurts me, no more than economics is there a subject of philosophy. Right? So this is the triple problem that Badju has. Why would you want to rehabilitate happiness under these circumstances? We have its corruption, we have a really strong critique of it from, from uh, anti-philosophy and probably paradigmatically psychoanalysis. And thirdly, we have a critique of happiness, uh, the idea of the happiness of, 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 of philo uh, that philosophy gives by Badger himself. Right? So this is Badger's problem in this tiny little book, Happiness, is that he's got these three problems. So what does he do in this book? Repeating in some ways the template that I've already briefly outlined for you at the beginning he pushes himself into a new position a fourth position which even criticizes and goes beyond his own established positions um, 
I will, I will actually uh, stop now, I, but I do want to make just a, uh, there's, there's obviously more to be said, but I want to say, I just want to say how, Badge, uh, how Badju does this. He wants to, uh, if I can even find, if I can even read, bear with me, friends. It gives us a formula Badju now, what Badju basically says in happiness is yes, only, you can only, only the philosopher knows true happiness. Totally contravening everything he said himself previously, contravening the, the, the psychoanalytic critique and seeming to conform to the neoliberal affirmation of happiness. But it turns out in a, uh, a way that neoliberalism probably wouldn't be too thrilled about. And that why? Because, and, and this is the formula I want to give to it. The job of the philosopher is to redeem the real from its present corruption by binding it to an idea that confronts the challenge of the strongest critique of that idea as one of the fundamental tasks of philosophy itself. So I hope you don't mind if I repeat myself, I'll just say that again slowly because I think it's absolutely fundamental, a sort of ground, ground orientation of Badju's entire work to redeem the real from its present corruption by binding it to an idea that confronts the challenge of the strongest critique of that idea as the work of philosophy itself. And in doing that, the, this perennial injunction of philosophy means that the philosopher himself, in this case Bad Jew, must in fact even critique all of his own, own previously held positions in order to construct a concept of happiness that conforms to, to, to none of them. Sorry, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>